The name of the message today is, What Does the Bible Really Say About Your Body, the Temple? Over the summer, we've been exposing some subtle errors that have crept into our circles, and Jesus warned us about this kind of thing. In Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9, the Bible says, hmm, Where are you going? But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Tonight we're going to look at our body, the temple. This covers a lot of things, from exercise, to diet, to tobacco, or tattoos, or anything in between. Our passage this evening helps us sift through the noise of cultural and personal preferences and get right down to how best to glorify God in our bodies. Now, this lesson is by no means exhaustive, but we will discover some interesting things as we answer the question, what does the Bible really say about your body, the temple? Well, the first thing that we're going to get into tonight is the concept of principles over particulars. And I think this is something we've been learning all summer, and that is um, when we add things that weren't in Scripture, this is similar to what the... the um, Pharisees did. The Pharisees, you know, they had the commandments of God, but then they added a bunch of stuff. God said, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. The Pharisees said, don't walk more than a mile or whatever, you know. Um, and um, God said, honor your father and mother. And, uh, and the Pharisees said, yes, but if you happen to be giving the money that you would be giving to your parents as a tithe, then it's okay. So um, they would go into specifics in order to find specific loopholes. So what we're going to see tonight is rather than looking at a bunch of specifics that aren't in the Bible, and then looking for the loopholes around the specifics that folks have made up, we find out what is in the Bible, and what is in the Bible is actually attitudes and principles that are way far overreaching and fills in all the loopholes. You with me? All things are lawful unto me. Stop. Oh, good. Let's, let's end. We'll sing uh, just as I am. We'll go home. No, wait, wait. But not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me. Well, good. You said it already. You said it twice. Oh, that's good. Let's just say just as I am. Go home. Hang on. But I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, I've used this verse before, but we need to understand this is specifically in the context that, it was going to, that is going to be talking about how we use our bodies. Meats for the belly, the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, what we have is a juxtaposition of lawful versus expedient. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. And expedient is sum fero, sum fero which means not everything brings us together. Oh, all things are lawful, but not all things brings us together. Matthew Henry, 
Let's see, do I have this here? Matthew Henry said, a Christian must not barely consider what is lawful, but what is expedient for the use of, he used the word, edification. Brings us together. So, when we start talking about the body as the temple, there are some folks that, uh, that do a bunch of interesting things. Um, and they'll do it with diet. Now, um, before you jump to conclusion, I'm not against diet. But some folks will look at Old Testament and say, oh, see there, this is what we should, this is what we shouldn't, this is what we should, this is what we shouldn't. And then we end up judging each other based on, um, based on the things that we come up with. But I think that we need to understand that in the Old Testament, the diet that was put together was for the, the Israelites and it was under a ceremonial system. Now, you say, yes, but God's word is forever. Yes, and there are certainly some principles we can get. However, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 14 shows us that diet is personal. One believeth that, uh, that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Now we're not talking about weak because he's not eating meat. He's weak because uh, weak in the faith. He doesn't understand all of these things. Look at this. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let not him which eateth not, judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. It's an interesting thing. What can happen very often when we start coming into, if you start to have some dietary convictions, and you should, and, and that's good, but then we want to make that for everybody. I know that growing up, do you know that I was out of my house, like, out of my house and in college before I ever tasted my first shrimp. That's because I was raised. That's disgusting. We don't eat sea bugs in this house. It's just bugs of the sea that foreigners eat. That's what I was taught. Then I had shrimp. And then I had lobster, big bugs in the sea. Me. But it was almost an immoral thing to consider to eat sea bugs. As I grew up, I realized what was immoral was eating steak that well done. But anyway, that, that's, a, that's a whole nother thing. Meat commendeth us not to God, for, for neither if we eat are we better, neither if we eat not are we worse. In Matthew, do, ye, do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the drop. Back in Romans 14, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And Paul explaining that, you know, the dietary laws, along with uh, other ceremonial laws, nailed to the cross. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or respect to holy days or new moon or the Sabbath days. That's all done. It's all nailed to the cross. So, um, can God guide us personally in our diet? Sure. And you know what? If you have a condition that's different than somebody else, and your doctor says, hey, you shouldn't have salt. Well, that doesn't mean that nobody should have salt. 
but it does mean that it would be wise to follow your doctor and you don't have salt. God can use that to say, hey, dude, don't eat salt. Does that mean the Bible says don't eat salt? No, but you're a steward of your body, the temple, okay? Diet is personal, okay. Another principle. Your body is God's holy creation. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Revelation chapter uh, 4 and verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. God created you for His pleasure. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 13, um, meats for the belly and belly for meats. God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So, your body is God's holy creation. So there are things for which your body is designed. Your body is designed to eat. Amen? Your body is designed to sleep. Your body is designed for a physical relationship with somebody of the opposite sex. But in each of those, there are boundaries that God tells us about. God talks about the sin of gluttony, the sin of being a sluggard. Is there anything wrong with eating? No. Is there anything wrong with overeating? Yes. Anything wrong with sleeping? No. Anything wrong with oversleeping? Yes. And the Bible gives us this boundary. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. There are things for which your body is not designed. Addiction. Your body is not designed for that. All things are lawful for me. All things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. That idea brought under the power is, is I will not be chained to anything. Your body is uh, not for addiction. It's not for fornication. That is sexual activity outside of marriage. Inside marriage, amen, it's great, it's, it's honorable, but outside marriage, God said no. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Now. There are folks today, and probably even in our schools today, they'll say, hey, listen, this is all natural. This is how you were designed. Yes, you were designed for that activity. No, you were not designed for it outside of marriage. Say, so how do you know? The Bible says so. Yeah, but is there science? First of all, if the Bible says it, you don't need somebody else to back it up. But there are, is plenty of research that says that this is the best and the way to a healthy and happy relationship. God's design is perfect. God hath, raised, hath both raised up the Lord and will raise us up by his own power. All right? Your body is God's holy dwelling place. God will not leave you. If you're saved, God will never leave you. Isn't that wonderful? But think about what that means. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, right? And the Holy Spirit will never leave you. Now let's think about that. That means if you take your body, where the Holy Spirit lives, into something that is unholy or ungodly, you're taking God with you. You're taking God's home. You're taking God's temple with you into that activity.
Let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now, that's a wonderful promise. But think about that. If he'll never leave thee. You know, sometimes we want to do something and we say, God, you can go around back if you'd like. And, 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 and we'll get together in a minute. Give me some alone time. God doesn't give you alone time. So we have this, know ye not, that ye are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now we talk about the temple. In the Old Testament, there was a lot about the temple being a holy place. You didn't bring, you didn't bring um, Gentiles in there. You didn't bring unclean animals in there. You kept this place holy. This is the place where we worship God. This is the place where the, the presence of God shows up. Now the Bible is saying, if you're a born-again believer, the presence of God is in your body. So then, that matters with this matter of fornication. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. We are members of of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. But whoever that you have a physical relationship with, you become one with. That's why the Bible says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And then Jesus talks about that same passage, For this cause... Shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife? And they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So there is no such thing then as a casual physical encounter. Two are becoming one. And you're taking, and if you do it outside of marriage, you're taking the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, along for the ride. What? Know you not, that he which is joined to a harlot is one body, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. If a Christian joins, well, look at what happens. Know you not, that your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. I'm taking Jesus where I go. So your body is God's holy tool. Now, again, you'll hear it. You'll hear it in secular counseling. You might even hear it in quote-unquote Christian counseling. You'll hear it, uh, you'll see it on Facebook. You'll hear it in school. Listen, uh, physical relationship, there's just natural. There's nothing wrong with it. You have at it. Go ahead and explore it. You be you. Listen, you weren't designed for that. You're designed for holiness. Your body is God's holy tool. So we have this warning. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. The old... Uh, Preacher John Chrysostom said, Marriage is not an evil thing. It is adultery that is evil. It is fornication that is evil. Marriage is a remedy to eliminate fornication. So your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Verse 19. What? No, you're not. That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. Isn't it interesting here? A lot of times when we have, oh, your body is the temple, we talk about a lot of stuff that we haven't, uh, that is not mentioned in this passage. The primary thing in 1 Corinthians 6, when Paul is saying, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, is saying, therefore, keep it holy. You keep away from fornication. That's the huge thing. 
No, he could say, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, so you should not be eating M&Ms or fried chicken or whatever. And you know what? If God has given you a conviction against eating M&Ms and fried chicken or chicken fried in M&Ms or whatever, <laughs> great, don't eat it. But the big push here is for purity. Listen, you're going to look at the television and even, even uh, in stuff that's supposed to be for teenagers and for kids, the assumption is you go on a date, within the first date or two, you're going to have a marital type relationship. And that's just assumed. It's just normal. It's just, oh, well, have you done it yet? It is a weird thing in this world for someone to remain pure until marriage, but that is the standard. That ought to be your goal, and that ought to be something, the hill that you're willing to die on. No, you're not. You are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Man, that's powerful stuff. What agreement had the temple of God with idols? You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So fornication is against the temple, and you want to beware of temple desecration. Why? Oh, here it is, verse 20. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Your body has been purchased with Christ's blood. Therefore glorify God in your body. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And glorify God in your spirit. So we have found some interesting things this evening. While the Bible doesn't specifically address diet or exercise or tobacco or a myriad of other things, it does give us some pretty overarching principles. God knows it, that when specifics are mentioned, loopholes are searched for. But here's the thing. Our body's not our own. That's the principle. We're not to be controlled or addicted to anything. That's the principle. We're not to be impure sexually. That is the principle. We're not to do, we are to do what it takes to glorify God with our bodies. That's what the Bible really says about your body, the temple. Thank you, God, for the truth of your word. And help us, Lord, to follow you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Hymn number